Okay, it's being recorded. Can you hear me? You keep freezing on us. Oh, can you guys see me okay? Yeah, we can see you, but um, it says internet connection is unstable. Where are you? Are you at home? Yeah, I'm at home. Or is that your connection or my connection? I don't know. It might be ours. The weather's terrible here. It could be ours. Our office is usually good, but we got it's raining a lot outside. I don't know if that's affecting it. I don't know. Okay. Can uh, somebody pop in and let us know if uh, if everyone can hear everyone okay? Can we hear Jerry and can you hear me? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. So why don't we get started? Uh, uh, Anna, I, I curated a list of questions that we we had gotten before this call. So why don't we go through those and then some of them at least, and then we'll uh, we'll open it up to everyone so they can kind of go forward. Is that fair? I've got to keep going. I'm taking this call. Just go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we can. I I did some research and everything on the questions you sent. So. Okay, cool. So let's start with this one. So this is a good question. Uh, what is a good way to take a furniture deposit, um, thus getting the tenants accountable for the property maintenance and cleanliness? So I, I've had this happen, especially on a student rental, I guess, like if they come in and bring their own furniture and then leave it after the tenancy's over is there is there a legal way to collect a deposit within the lease so that you can recover costs if you have to get rid of the furniture so according to section 138 of the residential tenancies act it's actually illegal to even ask for that deposit really any any additional charges um it, it lays out all the additional charges that you're not allowed to ask for so you can't ask for um a rental unit fee, a premium, a commission, a bonus, a penalty, a key deposit, and it doesn't matter if these are refundable. They're ultimately illegal. According uh, to the Residential Tenancies Act. Yes, that's correct. So the only deposit you can take is the last month's rent, unfortunately. Okay, fair enough. Other than that, you would have to make um, an application to the landlord tenant board. With to get it done legally. I think a lot of people still do it anyways, and I've done it in the past myself, but uh, I guess it can't, it, can't, it can't be enforced. Right. It, it, a, a lot of the places say it's technically illegal to ask, but a lot of these tenants don't actually know. I know my dad has a lot of rental properties and he does ask for these deposits. Mm -hmm. um, obviously when it's questioned, he can't take them. Okay. So, if the tenant were to go ahead and press charges, it actually is illegal okay, for you to fair. ask for that deposit. Fair enough. I think I think you can do a, a key deposit. I think that one's right in the standard lease. No, it it, it says in section 134, it specifically lays out key deposits are not allowed. Really? Yeah, because that's one of the discrepancies in the Ontario standard lease then, because there's a section that says key deposit, but the Residential Tenancies Act says different. It's ridiculous. Anyway, yeah. moving on. So this is another good one. It's happened to me too. So we're in a, a say, let's say a single family rental. You, you charge rent, whatever it is, plus utilities. The, tenant, the tenants um, have the water bill in their name. For whatever reason, after the tenancy is over or during the tenancy, the, 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 the water bill goes unpaid. And a lot of municipalities now have created uh, laws or bylaws where unpaid water bills can be added to the landlord's municipal property taxes. Yes. So if the tenants refuse to pay, what options does the landlord have at that point to collect what's owing? So it would have to be um, small claims court or the landlord tenant board. Um, if they've already moved out of the unit, unfortunately the landlord tenant board does not have jurisdiction. Got it. So if okay. it's if it's oh, a, sorry. If it's sorry. a small amount like two hundred bucks or three hundred bucks or even five hundred bucks, is it even worth it to go to small claims? It's not worth it. And a lot of the time these tenants don't have anything. 
any money, anything going for them. So they just avoid it. Um, don't even show up. It's, okay. it's unfortunate, but it is a risk that the landlords take. Mm -hmm. Got it. The, the workaround I've seen for that, um, I had a rental property in Cambridge and I think they were one of the first to change this and, and making the, 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 the tenants weren't even allowed to keep the water in their name. We had to keep it in the landlord's name, but the bill went to the house care of me so that they could open it and, and actually pay the bill. But the, but the bill was in my name so that if they didn't pay, they could add it to my taxes. But what we did is we made event, event the last lease we had before we sold it, we made the, the rent plus hydro and plus gas. And we just added the average cost of the water to the rent. So instead of charging 1800 bucks, we charged, you know, 1875, for example, only did plus hydro and plus gas so that we were taking the, taking it into the rent and, and just paying the bill. Right. I don't know that that's a perfect solution, but I, I've, I've heard this issue discussed a million times back and forth. I've heard about lawsuits against the, the municipalities about this one. So I wanted to get uh, your take on it. I mean, that, that solution seems to be the best option. Um, <laughs> sorry? Oh. Somebody needs to mute themselves there, maybe. Okay. Oh. okay. Was there anything else you wanted to add on that one? Sorry? You Was can't. there anything else you wanted to add there? Um, no, I do agree that your your option is uh, just upping that or upping the rent a bit to sort of reflect that to make sure that the landlords are protected with respect to that. Um, that would really be the only thing. So if you want to, let's say you want to rent the unit for $1,000 and, and you want to add the average cost to the rent, that would be the only other way around it. Okay. Okay, I got a good one here. Um in a commercial apartment building, you know, uh, especially in, in times like this, if, uh, you know, there's a coronavirus outbreak in your building and, you know, you have 30 tenants and 15 of them get diagnosed with Corona or COVID or whatever it is. Um, can you be liable as a landlord? So because it's unprecedented, we don't have case law to go off of with respect to this. Um, now if you're, if you're doing your due diligence, so you're not expected to, to make sure everyone stays in their house. I mean, that's not on you. Um, but you are expected to post some notices. That's always a good, a good way. Um, and if you, it, another way I've seen it done is notices. If you're diagnosed with COVID notify the property manager. Right. And then the, your, your information will stay anonymous. That way you can take precautionary steps. Um, as long as you're regularly disinfecting mm -hmm. the right. common areas, I, I would a hundred percent recommend closing the common areas with respect to like a gym, a common party room, that stuff. Absolutely close those because you will be charged if there's gatherings and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you just have to take precautions and show you're taking your due diligence. Another good way to avoid any liability in that situation is to note down every time you're disinfecting. So if you want to, okay, we disinfect this hour, that hour, we clean this, that, this, this time, you know, just keep a log of everything. Yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess if I guess you're, if oh, my sound's messing up here. One sec. I guess if you're showing that you're doing your due diligence and uh, that you've closed certain areas that are not necessities and, you know, you're doing your due diligence to clean as much as possible, then, you know, they can't find you at, at fault. I, I just saw a bunch of threads on that on social media and people were asking. So I think it's a good question to raise. Yeah, I think people are going insane right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and everyone's sort of angry and they're looking at someone to point fingers at. Um, but yeah, as long as the due diligence is taken, then then you're safe. Okay, perfect. Um, do, okay, here's one. Do you register your joint venture agreement with the lawyer? 
or can you just not sign it and not, can you just sign it and not show it to a lawyer? So let me rephrase this. So if you were doing a joint venture, regardless of what side you're on, whether you're the working partner or the money partner, do you need to register the joint venture agreement so it shows up on title or have it with the lawyer? Or can you just have the agreement between both parties? And are you okay if, if there's a discrepancy down the road? Obviously, it's, it's more beneficial to register it. You're a lot more protective. You're a lot more protected in that sense um, as opposed to going to court and fighting it out. So what does that actually mean? And, and this is even for my knowledge, like what does registering the joint venture agreement mean? Can, can it, does it show up when you search title or is it just in the lawyer's office or something? So it would be um, more with Canada Revenue Agency. Um, so it would, if, okay, what type of joint venture agreement are we talking? I guess that would be more specific. So let's say, let's say you and I buy the property and you buy, you and I buy a property and I, I'm the investor, I'm bringing the opportunity. You're putting up the money and qualifying for the mortgage and I'm bringing the opportunity and doing the ongoing management. And we have a joint venture agreement that says we're partners on this deal, but you're on title, I'm not on title. So I, I need that joint venture agreement to protect my interests in the property. Yeah, so you, then we could um, register a, a false mortgage. Oh, just to protect the... Yeah, just to protect that. That's normally what the steps we would take in that situation. Gotcha. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what else? I guess I was speaking more from a corporate standpoint. I apologize. There's, there's just three different types of agreements, so... Yeah, no, 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 for sure. Um, let me see here. So if you were doing a joint venture, like, like the example I described, you're putting up the money and doing the qualifying for the financing, I'm bringing the opportunity and doing the management. Should each party in the joint venture agreement have their own lawyer or is it okay to use the same lawyer? If you're going to use the same lawyer, there needs to be a paragraph in there. You need to know your rights to independent legal advice and you would, you would sign off on those rights. So it would say, I understand that I have the right to independent legal advice, I'm waiving that right. Something along those lines. Okay. Good. And I'm not being coerced in deciding this. Okay. I guess that's good to protect the lawyers too. Yeah. Um, okay. If you, if you uh, I guess this is more, uh, we'll say this one to the end. Uh, would it be possible? Oh, I like this one. Would it be possible, and if so, what would be the process of selling a house and keeping ownership of the land? This is a Jerry question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll save that for Jerry. Um, if you, uh, let me just see if there's any more good ones here. Three partners are better for Okay. Okay. Let's, uh, let's move on. And do, do you have some clauses that we are putting into um, upgrading a person's sales and related to the whole kind of COVID thing? So Jerry and I actually spoke about this the other day. Um, and, and we haven't seen it. We haven't been doing it. I had a client ask for it. Um, but it just, it, it doesn't seem to be affecting. I mean, the only thing that would really affect is if you lost your job. And now there's been a material circumstance, a material change in circumstance, and you can no longer get a mortgage. But I, I mean, that would just be a financing clause. And that would well, be- well, 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 I guess what happens before closing, like if you, if you have your financing clause and then at the time you get financing, everything's okay. And then closing's not for 90 days. And then you lose your job two weeks before closing and the lender finds out and- pulls your financing. Now I mean, it's happened and deals have fallen through. Yeah. So then at that point, does the buyer lose their deposit? They do. Yeah. Unless they're able to get a private mortgage last minute. I mean, we had a file last week that, that did that. They, the seller fell through and, and they had to, sorry, the buyer fell through, but they had already purchased another home. Now is, is there clauses we can put in beforehand that would give the buyer protection in 
in the, in that case? I mean, it would it would just be if the seller would be agreeable to it. Um, mm -hmm. Because I mean, that's allowing you to get your deposit back if you if you can't close the day of, and now now the sellers incurred fees. Yeah, it's it's be a tricky one. So what I'm getting at, everyone, is we we've been talking about this in 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 my circles and with with my 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 sales team, of course, and it, it hasn't happened so far. But I mean, when this all kind of came down on us, it was definitely a point of conversation. Is that let's say. Uh, I'm representing Anna. Anna's buying a property. Everything's good. She's a lawyer. She works. She gets her financing a week before closing. She can't close because she lost her job due to COVID, right? Whatever it is due to COVID. And you insert something beforehand. Oh, welcome back, Jerry. Hey, well, how are you doing, guys? Can so who's with us? We got, uh, we got 66 people. How are you, everybody? <laughs> I only see Mike and Julia. Good. Hi. Hello. Good. Good. Sorry, I'm I'm in the middle of a headache, and I'm trying to deal with it. Sorry. No we're Jerry. We're we're saying, uh, uh, and and I th I think Anna's point makes sense. Is there anything, any kind of wording clauses we can insert in the Schedule A to protect a buyer in the case that they can't close, uh, you know, after waiving their financing if they lose their job due to COVID. And then Anna was saying that, yes, you can, but it, it, it would have to be something the seller agrees to, which is going to be a challenge. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you can put anything like that in. I think, Paul, I think you have to deal with on, on a on a um, unit by unit basis, because don't forget, what, what do you guys do if all 30 people walk out? Yeah, that's crazy. Right? What financial risk are you? I mean, we got to look at the other end, too. Mm -hmm. Right. What if the market, you know, uh, bottoms out and all, how many units is there? 30, right? We're doing, yeah, 30. 30. All 30, all 30 buyers say, sorry, Paul, we can't close or we've changed our mind no, you just can't. because, right. What, what do you guys do at that point? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you can't, I think you're opening up a can of worms doing that. Let's keep our fingers crossed that, um, you know, all of this is behind us by then. Um, you're looking at what's a time frame from start to finish? Well, a regular closing, you know, 30 days, 60 days, 90 no, days. No, no, but what time, what's the time frame to close? When do you think it's like, is it going to September 2021, 2022? When do you think these things are going to close? Oh, my project you're talking about, probably yeah. 21 into 22. Okay. Yeah. You're at, so you're talking, okay, your project, okay. We, and, we, we were just talking about that in general, like in general, I, I, buyers should be thinking about inserting, but it, it opens up too many can of worms, I yeah, think. I mean, a seller, I mean, if I'm a seller, I, I don't have a firm deal then until it closes. Yeah, basically. Exactly, right, I don't have a firm deal. So how do I go and buy another property? Because unless the, the seller in that property, all of a sudden now I've got to say, and by the way, if you know the day before closing the buyer of my property backs out i get to back out of your place i mean it it, it, it it's not going to work i mean um i wouldn't recommend starting to put anything like that in there i think it muddies up the water okay um so, okay. and and we just i mean if there's a possibility that someone's going to lose their job then maybe they got to hold off until things stay you know i mean you put the onus a little bit on on the purchaser to say, hey, if you think there's a possibility that you're going to lose your job, you better sit tight here or have a backup plan. Maybe you've got to put a little bit more down and we have to tap somebody like Dave into some private funds. You know, because private funds are always available mm -hmm. if you're putting a little more equity down. Yeah, for sure. There's going to be better solutions beforehand. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. I want to go back to a question uh, where we, we might need your input here. Uh, would, it be, would it be possible? And if so, what would be the process of selling a house, but still keeping ownership of the land? Selling the house. Yeah. Is it possible? And it how is possible, but somebody has got to remove the house from the, from the land. <laughs> yeah. Or it right. could 
or, or yeah, can you, you sell, can't. The house, sell the house and do a lease back or a land lease or something? It doesn't make no, sense. no, no, you can't, you can't, you can't separate the two. Got I mean, it. You would have to physically pick up the house and move it. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good one. Well, believe it or not, I've seen it happen where, you know, somebody's buying a piece of property to build a new house or a new development. And there is, obviously, there can't be a basement. Uh, even, oh, actually, I've even saw ones with basement where they jacked them up off the basement. They put the flatbed underneath it, almost like the portables at schools. Yeah, yeah. Right? And they move them. I, I've seen that happen. But typically, you can't separate the ownership of the the land and the ownership of the lot. Um, I've seen it done at like trailer parks and things like that. Yeah, that's different. Right, where, where um, you know, you know where it's very popular. They don't have, don't have title uh, to a place like Sobel B. Those people don't have title to a specific lot of land. Yeah, in Sobel Beach, because it's uh, native, na the land is owned by the natives, right? Yep. They, lease, they lease the land to you and allow you to put um, a house on it. Right? Yep. In that case, it's a movable trailer. Exactly. So, I mean, technically, I mean, so going back now that I'm kind of rehashing it, yeah, I guess if I had an empty piece of land and you had a trailer and you said to me, I want to park my, my mobile trailer on your property and, and live there, I could say, great, pay me X number of dollars just for using my land. Yeah, or a land lease or something. Yeah, but you're not, you can't do it if it's a fix. If the house is affixed to the land, mm -hmm. right, with a basement and everything, that all goes part and parcel when you sell it. Okay. Okay, back to another question now. If, if uh, the example is we're, we're doing, Anna and I are doing a joint venture, She's bringing the capital, the money, and and qualifying for the mortgage. I'm bringing the the property, the opportunity, and I'm I'm in, I'm doing the ongoing management. I mean, we're doing a joint venture. That joint venture agreement, you know, what are the implications of making the agreement with a lawyer? But do we need to register it to title or something? Um, or, or is it okay just for the, me who's not on title just to hold the agreement in my filing cabinet or leave it with my lawyer or with you or something? Um, and that's a, a case by case decision. So if it's you and I and we're two brothers doing it, mm -hmm, yeah, I'd probably yeah. say keep your hands on it, put it in your drawer and just, I don't think your brother's going to do anything to, to, do you out of your property, even though stranger things have happened. But if it's your brother, if it's your father, if it's your mother, I, I, I wouldn't worry about it. I get a little bit more concerned when it is a, um, a individual who's more of a stranger that you're getting into business with. Because the problem is without registering anything on title, you could have the person that owns the property, sell it, take the money and take off, yeah. right? That's, that's the reality of it. So what I've done in the past is, you can't do it right away because the bank, there's some restrictions with the bank. But what we've done is two things. A, a couple of times we went and registered a mortgage for a dollar yeah. on the property. Right, just that way, guess what? When they go to sell a property, somebody's gonna have to contact you to ask you to discharge that mortgage, okay? Mm -hmm. That's one way of doing it. The second way of doing it is just registering a caution. You just register your interest on the property, it just says, hey, I, Paul DeBruzzo, have an interest in this property. And in that way, nothing can happen to the property. And that's normally what I recommend. Got it. Yeah, that's, that's the, but that, but if you trust the person, if, if there's a caution on title, like you say, would it stop you guys or would the lenders be concerned with that down the road? If you want to refinance, like, would you have to take it off and put it back? Yes, on? absolutely. Absolutely. That's the, exactly. So if the, if the guy, if you're, you and your, and, and so you and your joint venture partner decide you want to refinance, 
you come to me and say, hey, Jerry, you know, I got a caution. Take it off because we're going to refinance. And then put it back. Right? And then we'll put it back later on, right? Yeah. But if, you, if your partner tries to do it without your knowledge, they're not going to be able to. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, cool. Uh, I got a question here from the group. Uh, I, I got like one or two more questions people handed out and then you guys can unmute yourself. I know everyone's shy on Zoom for some reason, but in, in a couple of minutes, you can unmute yourself and ask Jerry directly. If the property manager fails to attend to a request for some kind of property service, example, a water leak, can you terminate their service agreement immediately or do you still need to give them 60 days notice? That really depends on the wording of the contract you have with the property managers. Lots of contracts that I've seen um, provide some termination clauses. You know, if, if you don't do this, I have the right to terminate you immediately. Or I've seen ones that say, if you fail to do it, I've got to give you a 30 days notice. And if it happens again, I get to terminate. That really is contract by contract. Um, there's no set rule. It depends on what you negotiate with, with a uh, property manager. Got it. Okay. Um, let me see if I have one more on this list. So just to re reiterate for everybody, cause it was a big topic. So the, the whole, what you repeat that Paul, I lost you. Yeah. I muted myself. Sorry. So just to reiterate for everyone. So it's, it's clear, uh, as in regards to clauses specifically for COVID that you would put in the offer, we're saying that if you're a buyer, you know, you're, we're not putting anything uh, related to that in the offer because it, it's, it's got to be a case by case basis. And it, even if you do get it in there and the seller agrees, it's probably opening up a can of worms that you don't want. It, exactly. There's, there, there's been, um, there was, a, a, I think the Toronto real estate board, had recommended to real estate agents. They put in clauses that says, you know, if the banks close, uh, you know, and, and lawyers, uh, uh, the law society has ripped apart those clauses saying it's causing more problems than it's fixing. And the reality of it is, you know what? If the registry system closes or banks shut down, and <laughs> the, the contract's frustrated. I mean, it, it it's going to be extended by operation of law. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So I, I have. Uh, I just gotta. I just gotta. Um, keep, I can hear you. I'm just. If you look behind you on your left, Paul, you can see me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, l let's open up the Q and A. So uh, uh, let, let's be kind and, and polite. If, if you have a question for Jerry, please unmute yourself and kind Hi, of raise your hand. Okay, Julia has a question. Hey, Julia, I'm right here. I'm just, I'm, Thank you. I know you no, it's okay. Leave it there. I'm just, yeah, Julia, I'm just behind you. Yeah, first We're of all, hello, my beautiful people. Hi. Hi, go ahead with your question. I'm sorry? No, she's bad. Bad connection. Hi, Paul. I have a question for Go ahead, Jerry. Jerry. Hi there. Hi. Hi, Hi Jerry. So hey, question hey. here. So what if the best way to protect uh, myself if I bought a property and assign it to another buyer and then the buyer wasn't able to close it? What's the best way to protect yourself? Yeah, regarding well, assigning a property. I bought a property from a seller and then I'm assigning it to another buyer. And unfortunately, the buyer wasn't able to close it. Well, there's really no way. I mean, the only way to protect yourself is um, usually get a sufficient deposit from the person you've assigned it to. Because if so... 
so that you you can you can jump on this transaction if you have to. So if you have to close it, but if at the end of the day, in the contract it says you have the right to assign the transaction and it falters the the buyer the seller can only go after the person you assigned it to they can't go after you right i mean if that provision is in the in the contract it, if it's not in the contract then you have to be ready to close so the only way you can protect yourself is you know before somebody buys you know take them to someone like Butler and, and make sure that the person is rock solid and there, there is no issues because yes, there is, if the person goes bankrupt, you can't protect yourself. And then another question, just last question, Paul, Here, uh, with regards to if I'm selling the property, uh, if I'm the buyer and uh, the seller sells it to me and I put a condition there, uh, possession, uh, vacant possession upon closing. However, uh, the seller wasn't able to fulfill, even though he filled up N11, uh, the tenant did not live. So what would be the best recourse? But I wanted to buy that house. And the tenant has not left? Yes. Well, I mean, you always have the option of extending the transaction until the, the seller can get the tenant out. I would not buy it. I mean, I just had one with um, a, a rock star client actually, and it was a property in Stony Creek and there was a, a, a really bad tenant and they couldn't, and I, you know what? I said to my, I said to the client, I would walk away unless the guy can give you a vacant possession. I wouldn't be taking an ugly tenant on because you're asking for trouble. The residential tenancy board is skewered in favor of the tenant. They see the landlord as the fat cat. They will bend over backwards to help the tenant. Mm -hmm. And if you get a tenant that knows what they're doing, you're asking for trouble. So to answer your question, the tenant, tenant doesn't want to leave. Hey, Mr. Seller, I'm willing to give you another week or two to get the tenant out, but I'm not taking the house over with that tenant in there. Okay. okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Okay. Anybody else? I, I have a question. Go for it. Hey, so I'm closing on a property um, next month with a joint venture. Um, and we, we are going to put it under a corp. Um, and I just wanted to know what your suggestion would be on the best way to, to structure it. Um, putting it in a corp with the assumption that we're going to hold on to this for the long term. Um, You're putting what in a corp? Sorry, what, what's that? Sorry, ask him, is he putting the title into a corp or the JV into a corp? Um, so so we, we're, gonna, we're going to be opening a corp just for the purchase of this property. And are you going to be able to get financing under the corp? That's always the issue. Okay, I'll start um, my video. Um, yeah, so we're, we're going we're gonna to be getting financing um, from BMO. It's, it's going to be a 50-50 structure. And the plan is to hold on to this property for um, so why do you 20 years or more. So then why do you need a joint venture agreement? Why don't you do it? So why don't, if you and your partner are going to have shares in the corporation, I'm back now, guys. Sorry, I had to, had to wire some money. Um, so if you are buying the property, if Primo is going to lend you the money under the corporation, Mm -hmm. right? yeah. you and, and I'm, I'm assuming you're going to want you and your partner to guarantee that loan, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We have to personally guarantee it. Yep. You don't need a, you don't need a joint venture agreement. What you're going to do is you're going to have 50% of the shares. Your yep. partner's going to have 50% of the shares and you're going to do a shareholder agreement. You're not doing a joint venture agreement. All of, I mean, it's, it's going to look like a joint venture agreement, right? But I mean, at the end of the day, 
Um, it's a shareholder agreement because the property is owned under the corporation. The only time you do, the only time you need a joint venture agreement is, you know, you and I are buying a property together, okay? I mean, if we both decide to go on title, we really don't need, we need a partnership agreement, right? Because we're both on title, we're both protected. You mm-hmm. need a joint venture agreement when I buy it and it goes into my name and you're coming in as my partner, but you're not being shown on title, right? The concern right. is I can deal with that property. And that's what we were talking about earlier, registering the caution. I can deal with that property without your knowledge or consent. I can sell it. You know, it's made $100,000. I sell it and I, uh, you know, go to Turks and Caicos for, for the rest of my life. Yeah. If right? we, if I, I go live at Paul's, I go live at Paul's condo. <laughs> no, but if, you know, but if you're buying under a corporation, right, I would structure everything within that corporation. Now, what it does, it gives you the flexibility because if you guys decide you want, if, if you and this specific partner want to buy another property, you've already spent the money on your um, shareholder agreement. You don't have to do any more agreements, right? You can go ahead. Right. You guys can buy five more properties under that corporation. And okay. And for the is a great vehicle. In fact, it's a better vehicle than the joint venture agreement. The problem is with the, with the corporation, many times banks won't give you the financing under the corporation. That's the problem. Okay. Right? So if yeah. you're lucky enough to have a, you know, a bank that'll do it for you, I would just, that, that's fantastic. And I would just be doing a shareholder agreement. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah. Yeah, the only the only other question I had as a follow up to that is the plan is that um, we 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 may or may not purchase more properties under this corp, but I we're thinking like really far in the future as to how we can pass this down to our kids um, without having to sell the property and avoid like the most amount of taxes. So like um, somebody threw around the the word or the name or the type of um, corporate structure or account that we would be that we would get would be the uh, a bear trust um no, no, no. The, no. so how you protect your kids with corporations and i did a i did one of the podcasts that i did with uh with tom and nick um if you listen to it uh you can set up and i recommend to people that have uh corporations what's called a secondary will. So in law, you can have two wills. One deals with your personal um, assets, your house, money in the bank, et cetera, right? The second one can deal with the corporation. So it says, hey, if I die, all of the shares in that corporation are going to pass to my children. Right, okay. All right. I mean, so yeah. what you do is you you avoid any probate fees that are triggered. Now, obviously, if your shares in that corporation have increased its value, you your family's still going to have to pay some capital gains, right? Mm-hmm. But your children will now take that property and take the asset <clears throat> without being without a probate necessary. And you get around. So, you know, you're saving your family potentially. If, if your corporation is worth a million bucks, you're saving your family 15 or 20 grand in uh, probate fees. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Paul, I've got a question. Go ahead, Greg. Um, in my leases, I have a whole bunch of extra clauses as part of Section 15. Are any of those actually enforceable? Like, does landlord and tenant board actually care? Will they do anything? Like, if the tenant doesn't do something they agreed to do or does something they said they wouldn't do? Like like what? Oh, things like, you know, you can't put recreational vehicles in the yard. You have to keep the 
land cleared, you know, you can't smoke, you can't grow marijuana, you can't do things. They're all technically legal in the general sense, but they're in my lease saying you can't do those things. I'll let I'll let Anna answer that because she's she's a landlord and tenant expert. Okay. They're they're going to take the tenant side unless it's unless they're committing an illegal act, a criminal offense. It, they're going to take the tenant side. It it always is. Um, technically, you can request that they don't smoke in the property, and if they do, they do. It's, it's unfortunate. Yeah, just like clauses that says you can't bring pets in, right? You release it to them. Six months later, the guy goes, no, nah, I'm going to get a dog. You say, well, you agreed not to get a dog. The problem is under the landlord and tenant, under the residential, I'm an old guy, so I still call it the landlord and tenant board. You, you can tell lawyers age by how they call that, eh? It's called the residential tenancy board. But anyway, under the residential tenancy board, there's only certain grounds that you're allowed to kick a tenant out. One of them is non-payment of rent. Second, conversion of the unit from a rental unit to a personal use unit. So, you know, you have one of your kids that's gonna be, needs a house and decides they're gonna move into that house. That's grounds to kick them out, okay? Um, the other ground is that you're gonna you know, do major renovations and you can kick them out. But those grounds are really limited. Or right. as Anna said, they're committing some illegal activity. They're, they're running a, you know, a drug shop out of there. Or they're running a, you know, a bordello or something. You can kick them out. That's it. You can't go to the tenant landlord and say, hey, you know what? I told the guy he's got to cut the grass and he refuses to cut the grass and I want to kick him out. Yeah, from, Land, residential tenancy board is going to say, "Sorry, we can't do anything about that." From from a property yeah. management perspective, if, if right? If you're smoking and you're getting complaints from other tenants, yeah, then, then you have a bit more. Demand. If they're if they're cutting out the reasonable enjoyment of other tenants, then that's a whole other right. application you can make. But it really is, like I said, um, very very difficult. It's never easy uh, getting a tenant out. And that's why you got to be really, really picky when you get your tenants. From a property management perspective, Greg, it, it's still a better idea to have those things in, even though they might not be enforceable, because you're just setting the expectation ahead of time that, you know, you want the property respected and treated a certain way. If you just tell them, hey, you can do whatever the hell you want, then you're just kind of opening up a can of worms. So we're all in the kind of we're all in the kind of same boat there. And, you know, I, I this sounds terrible and I'm going to say it anyway, but there's a 10 percent rule with tenants. Right. 10 percent of your tenants are going to be people you make friends with, people you would invite over for a coffee if you wanted to. And there's going to be 10 percent of your tenants that, you know, are going to be your worst nightmare. And most of them are going to fall somewhere in the middle. And your entire job as a landlord for your entire career is to just avoid that bottom 10%. If you can do that, then you're going to solve 90% of your problems before they ever start and begin with anyway. So that's, that's what we're kind of stuck with. And until this residential tenancies act kind of gets cleaned up. Some of the, some of the things you could do, I mean, um, you know, if you wanted to get creative, like uh, snow, snow removal, grass cutting, things of that nature, right? You could, you could put a clause in the, you could put a clause in the lease that says, hey, your lease is gonna be $2,000 a month. However, if you're cutting the grass on a weekly basis, I'll give you a, I'll give you a $200 a month discount or something to that effect. Right. I, I do a separate legal, a separate document, a completely separate agreement where I hire them to do the land. Exactly. And then I pay them for it in return. They bumped up the rent, but there's no documentation anywhere that I increase the rent, only that I'm paying them. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you can get creative. You can get creative. I mean, like I said, um, and then at the end of the day, the guy's not cutting the, the grass, you don't pay him. You call, you call a you know, landscape company, 
to cut the grass. Right. So th that one is good. It's just every other clause seems to have no backup, nothing you can do other than say you agreed. So would you please get on and do it? You know, or, or I, I will agree with Paul that it's better to put it in than not to put it in because you will get the tenants that go, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's almost like, hey, guys, come on, be ethical here. This is what we agreed to. You know, do it for me. And, and you will get the tenants that go, yeah, that's what I agreed to. And, you know, I'm a person of my word and I'm going to do what I agreed to do. Right. I mean, you might get the guy that says, hey, Greg, a uh, piece of paper, you know where you can shove it, right? right. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Okay, we probably got time for one more before we hit the hour mark. So let's, uh, anybody want to step up and have another question? Hi, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Julia. Yeah, hi. So that uh, all uh, previous questions brings to the very good point that we actually discussed this week on a VIP call with Kelly uh, that uh, like it was a Q and a then. So with what LTB does uh, even before now, there was a, as you, Chris, of course, no, uh, wait, sorry, Jerry, with the, uh, this whole clause with ombudsman, right? And then there were a lot of signatures. They were investigating the delays in LTB. You don't deal with LTB that much, but you may be dealing with more than $35,000 claims that some landlords may face with the tenants. And there is also on the horizon slowly emerging some action to the uh, like uh, class action. So what do you see from your Supreme Court view in terms of this, please? Are, are you talking about um, uh, the, the, the... LTB processing the, times? The Ontario... Ombuds, the, of the, landlords? the Ontario Ombudsman investigating the delays at the uh, Landlord and Tenant Board? Yes. But after that, there is also there is also um, the oh, right, there, there is also uh, like um, they are thinking like smaller landlords are thinking of making class action. I googled what class action is, and this is when a group of individuals hire a top top lawyer like you, Jerry R, <laughs> and then uh, filing uh, filing a case against some governmental body or. What is that overall? Have there been any landlord class actions in bef before that? And what, is, uh, what are the details of that and what the landlords can, can actually do to somehow further protect them oh, based okay. on I'm, current situation? I'm gonna, Ju Julia, I'm gonna rephrase the question so we, we got it straight. So Jerry, I don't know if you're aware that there was, a, there was an investigation by the Ontario Ombudsman at the end of last year um, investigating the, the severe delays at the landlord and tenant board. Now, the outcome of that, I have no idea what happened. And there was a whole bunch of talk and, you know, through the grapevine about landlords coming together and making a class action lawsuit. So I think that's what she's kind of referring to. Maybe she's just uh, looking I'm here. not aware of it. I can, you know what I can do, Paul? Why don't I have my, my capable uh, article student, Anna, why don't, why don't I have her look into that? And maybe she can send you a quick email and then you can yeah. go back to sort of what happened with that class action lawsuit. I, I think that was just talk. It was more, there, there was an official investigation by the ombudsman regarding the delays at Landlord and Tenant Board. Okay. I, Sorry to interrupt. They were, they were trying to bring an administrative action against the ombudsman. Is that what you're saying? No, my understanding, and I may have the language mixed up because I don't speak legalese, but the, somebody, some Ontario government body was uh, investigating why there was so many delays at the landlord tenant board. I was aware, I thought it was the ombudsman who was doing the investigation, but I might be wrong, but there wasn't a, some official investigation. Okay. Okay. Well, and Anna can definitely look into it and sort of, and you know what she'll do, Paul, she'll send you a quick email or if there's an article that she finds 
um, about it, she can just kind of send that off to you and you can share that with uh, okay. all the participants today. Okay, so why don't we do that? So uh, Jerry, I appreciate your time. What I'm gonna do for everybody on the call is I'm gonna put in uh, uh, the link, the URL to subscribe to my email list. And if Anna sends me information or an article or an update on what's going on here, I'll, I'll send it out to the, the whole email list. If you're not on my email list, I'm giving you the link so you can sign up to the email list. So Jerry, thanks for doing this. I know you're busy with all kinds of other stuff. Did you want to say no anything? Problem. My, my pleasure. And Paul, and yeah. just, just for everybody, guys, if you, you know, if you have a question and you're not sure, I mean, direct it through Paul or send it directly to Ann and I. We're more than happy. Even if, you know, even if you are using a different lawyer, I won't be happy. But I mean, I'll still answer your questions. I'll still answer your questions. If, uh, you know, if you have anything and you're not sure, just give us a quick ring. I mean, we work, we, we're trying to work as much as possible with Rockstar. So if you're a Rockstar member, we consider you family. So we'll, we'll treat you like family. So, some, a lot of people aren't, aren't here or not, but uh, like I said, if you're coming through me and you refer through me, then Jerry will. Yeah, uh, of course. Same thing. Absolutely. I know Art Compagnone is on this call and he had a question. If you want to jump on Art, we got like two minutes and you can get it in. If you're busy at work, I, I understand also. And uh, you can email Jerry another time. But uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We can hear you, Art. Oh, okay, cool. Um, quick one. So I have a fence that fell down. There's a bit of a history, but to make it, it's, it's a wooden fence, fell down. Um, the neighbors, it's surrounded by three neighbors. They all, basically two neighbors claim that the original owners built it. They say it's my fence. So they don't want to pay a cent. Um, anyways, I don't know if it's on the property line, so I don't know if it is my fence. Um, it has fallen down. It's fell down for a while, but because of the snow and et cetera, I couldn't fix it. So I hired a contractor, but in the last week, uh, the back neighbor, the fence fell on his garden. He tried to move it and pick it up and it basically fell on him and hurt him. And he's got a broken tooth and some bruises. He called me, he wants me to pay for the dentist. <laughs> and I told him I was gonna pay for, I'm paying for the fence. Contractor is supposed to come tomorrow now because of the rain. So I'm paying for the fence to repair it, but he's saying he wants me to pay for his dentist too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not laughing at you. I tell him to go fly a kite. He hurt himself on his own property. All right, Pardon? he hurt himself on his own property. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what I said. It was on his property, yeah. yeah. I'd be saying, sorry, not doing that. And, you know, with regards to, I would tell him to go fly a kite, and with regards to the responsibility of your neighbors for the fence, some municipalities, believe it or not, have a fence bylaw. Yeah. Oakville does. Yeah. yeah. And that fence bylaw says that if one neighbor wants to put the fe a fence up, the other neighbor is obligated to pay for a share of it. The problem is, typically, it only allows for the cost of, you know, the, um, you know, like the, the, the mesh fences, what are they, like the... Um, the wire fence there. Oh, yeah, like the, the construction fences. Fences. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fine yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it only allows, so I mean, at the end of the day, I, I normally say, you know what? Go to your neighbor, you want to put a wooden fence up and the neighbor doesn't want you to put it up. I normally suggest you even keep it a little bit onto your property, even though you're losing a little bit of property, keep build the fence a little bit onto your property. Well, it's repairing, sorry, it's repairing a fence that fell down. Yeah. It was, yeah. I would just, in that particular case, I would just put it back exactly on the same line it was before. Yeah, and that's what I'm doing, and I'm paying for it. And I got a ton. I'm giving you a free fence because I'm paying for the whole thing. Yeah. And he's saying, "Well, yeah, you need to do that, but you also need to pay for my dental bill." And I yeah, said, "Don't, well, don't, 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 don't go fly kite on that." Okay. That's what I was thinking. I just thank you, thank you very much. Okay, let's leave it like that, Jerry. Uh, we love you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Anna. Thanks for uh, all your research and help with it. We'll we'll do it again another time. Good, guys. Thank you very much. Nice talking to everybody. 
And uh, like I said, if you guys have any questions, filter them through Paul. We'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Ciao. Bye, guys.